Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our first presenter for today. So Professor Martin Vanderbuse is a Professor of Neuroscience at La Trobe University, Melbourne. His research studies are focused on the role of brain systems utilising dopamine, serotonin and the trophic factor BDNF in psychosis and addiction. So this involves how the interaction of stress, genetic and environmental factors and sex hormones affect the brain in these illnesses. The approach is multidisciplinary, combining behavioural and neuroscience along with molecular techniques and human studies. He has also received numerous grants from the National Health and Mental Research Council to support his research. Professor Van der Buse is first or senior author on more than 200 research papers, book chapters and invited reviews. His publications have been cited by others more than 5,000 times. He has served on several academic committees and is currently graduate research coordinator of the university's School of Psychology and Public Health. For several years, he was council member of the Soci International Society for Serotonin Research and was pre president of this society in 2013 to 2014. So thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Van der Buse, and I'll now hand over to you to present. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, let me, I'd like to start off my uh, presentation with a little story. Um, these photos were taken in the city of Vancouver in Canada, but really um, what I'm going to tell you could happen in many places. Um, Vancouver is a lovely city and not surprisingly um, was often voted the most livable city in the world and, uh, or after Melbourne, the second most livable city in the world. And I was there a few months ago for a conference. And as you do, when there is time uh, um, available, you go and sightsee in this lovely new place that you've never been to before. So here I was walking the streets in Vancouver, lovely sunny day. And then I suddenly noticed a young woman sitting on the pavement um, and just sitting there. Um, she was rocking slowly. She was um, mumbling unintelligibly, looking down. And when I got closer, she looked up at me. She mumbled something at me, and then she looked down again. Her, but I had noticed that her, her eyes were half closed, her face was thin, it was pale, it had a number of scabs and scars, and now she ignored me. What was I to do? I walked on, shocked perhaps, confused for sure, also a little ashamed. Should I have offered some sort of help? What was it that this young woman became like this? Of course, I had read about meth face, about methamphetamine abuse and what it can do to your body, to your uh, psycho psychological and physical um, health. But that was never real and here I was. At the same time as a neurobiologist, I couldn't help thinking about what actually happens in your brain when you take meth. So let's talk a little bit about the brain. The human brain weighs about a kilo and a half. Its volume is about 1.1 to 1.3 liters. With that, it makes up about 2% of the human's body weight. But that 2% uses about 20 to 25% of your oxygen and glucose supply. It's a very busy organ. The consistency of uh, the brain is something like tofu. But in that tofu, you'll find about 100 billion nerve cells. We call them neurons or the gray matter of the brain. And 100 billion is what I show there, 100 plus nine more zeros, or in other words, 15 times the global population in one brain. It doesn't stop there. All those neurons talk to each other. They may be connected to as many as 10,000 other neurons, all in all, um, um, making this incredible network of connections and cells. And they're not the only cells in the brain uh, at all. So billions of nerve fibers, we call them the white matter. Now, neurons communicate with each other all the time, and they do that via electrical and chemical transmission. And let's have a look a little bit, a little bit of a look at that. So communication, as, as is shown here in this diagram, is first of all done by electrical impulses going down the nerve endings from one neuron to another. But then at the end, uh, there's uh, something special going on, 
And um, uh, what happens there is um, the nerve ending releases small amounts of chemicals called neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters travel along the gap between the nerve ending and the other neuron and um, uh, activate proteins in the surface of the other cell. And we call those proteins receptors. And with that communication is occurring between one neuron and the other. It's like a signal is being transmitted across the gap. There are actually many different neurotransmitters, for the, but for the purpose of this talk, I will um, uh, focus on dopamine, noradrenaline, and serotonin. These three neurotransmitters are involved in a lot of um, processes in the brain, and, and here are just a few of them. Uh, dopamine um, is involved in pleasure, reward, motivation and drive, but also many other functions, and in that it overlaps with serotonin and with noradrenaline. Now, how do drugs affect neurotransmitter systems? Well, it is that most drugs of abuse act sort of like imposters of the neurotransmitters we already have in our brain. Um, they piggyback, if you like, onto uh, existing regulatory mechanisms and transport mechanisms in the brain, and the brain just really can't tell the difference. Why is that? Well, if you just do a little bit of high school chemistry here, this is dopamine and this is noradrenaline. So they're fairly simple chemical structures. And if you compare that to methamphetamine and amphetamine, you see that they are very similar structures. And because of that similarity, um, the brain really treats methamphetamine and amphetamine like it would dopamine in many respects, but uh, in this case with detrimental consequences. That imposter idea is not unique to methamphetamine. If, for example, we look at um, a cousin, if you like, of methamphetamine, methylene dioxymethamphetamine, in otherwise known as MDMA or ecstasy, you can see that the structure is a little bit different, but that, that structure actually looks fairly uh, similar to serotonin in the brain, and that's why MDMA or ecstasy um, acts on the serotonin system more than uh, the dopamine and noradrenaline systems. So what does methamphetamine do in the brain? I have a little video here for you, which shows it in wonderful 3D. So let's have a um, little bit of a watch. Uh, it, it features most of the things I just explained to you. Our brains are finely tuned machines. Inside, cells called neurons are constantly communicating to shape how we think, feel, and act. Let's eavesdrop on their conversation. These are the ends of two neurons. The one on the right sends a message, and the one on the left receives it. At first, they look connected, but they are actually separated by a tiny space called a synapse, where messages are relayed. What we'll see next is how we normally experience pleasure. The sending neuron contains dopamine, the brain's pleasure chemical. When something good happens to us, this feel-good chemical is released into the synapse where it connects with receptors. There, dopamine activates the receiving neuron, which in turn conveys the message onto the next neuron, creating a chain reaction that produces pleasure. After the message is sent, Dopamine is recycled by transporters to be reused. This conversation repeating itself again and again gives us the feeling of pleasure. How does meth change our brain? When we use meth, it enters the bloodstream and travels to the reward center of the brain where it invades the sending neuron. Meth causes dopamine to unnaturally leak into the neuron, then spill into the synapse. Making matters worse, meth blocks the transporters, which recycle dopamine back into the sending neuron. This keeps levels abnormally high, overstimulating our brain. We feel a powerful wave of pleasure. The rush can last eight to 12 hours from just one dose. Meth causes dopamine to flood our receptors. When we stay up, Taking more and more meth, we exhaust our dopamine supply. When the regular dose doesn't give us the same rush, we take more. 
But now when meth reaches the brain, it finds a lot less dopamine. Plus, meth has destroyed transporters. And on the receiving neuron, all that overstimulation we loved has caused receptors to withdraw. So it's just harder to get high. No matter how much meth we use, we can never recapture that first rush. If you want to watch this video again, I've um, put the link to it down here so you can look it up on YouTube. Um, this shows very nicely what, how methamphetamine works and how chronic methamphetamine will have less and less of an effect. It doesn't quite um, address the toxicity of high levels of meth. Um, for example, all that dopamine that gets released may actually be converted into toxic radicals that is uh, damaging to the neurons. And we'll get back to uh, the damaging effects of methamphetamine in a minute. First of all, a little bit about the kinetics of the effect of meth. What you see here is um, uh, the, uh, a series of scans of the brain of an individual um, uh, injected with a small amount of radioactively labeled methamphetamine. And the scans uh, are, are more or less like when you look straight into an individual's head um, and you see the different brain structures and um, they light up, if you like, uh, and the more yellow and red they are, the higher the levels of methamphetamine or cocaine uh, for comparison. So what you can see is that, um, and these are minutes, very uh, soon after the injection of methamphetamine, the levels of uh, the drug go up in the brain, and you can see different brain regions with more meth than others, but uh, basically methamphetamine is all over the brain. Now, dopamine is highly concentrated in these areas here, but that's not the only place that methamphetamine concentrates. The other thing you can see is that it sticks around for a very long time. This is a very low dose of methamphetamine, but even that after 90 minutes is still uh, uh, present in substantial amounts. If you compare that to cocaine, it's perhaps more rapid. It's also more selective to where it goes in the brain and its effect wears off really, really quickly. So methamphetamine peaks fast, but it clears much slower than cocaine. So as I mentioned, chronic methamphetamine use can have a number of detrimental effects on the nervous system. Um, what we can see in uh, the brains of people um, uh, after long-term methamphetamine use is decreased numbers of neurons in several parts of the brain, reduced numbers of connections between these neurons. I mentioned earlier on how many connections there are. Those numbers go down. The levels of dopamine and serotonin transporters that I've mentioned in the video, they go down as well. So as a result, there are many cognitive effects of chronic use of methamphetamine. Effects on attention, judgment, problem solving, memory, and eventually perhaps psychotic symptoms. All of those things associated with the function of dopamine, noradrenaline, and serotonin in the brain. Can um, the situation reverse? So if you just stop using methamphetamine, will the brain go back to normal very quickly? Well, it will go back to normal, but not very quickly at all. Some studies, um, and this is a classical one, a uh, classic one um, quite a, a few years ago now, have shown, um, again, this is a scanner, a, a scan of the human brain, and here you see a marker for the dopamine transport. So that protein in the brain that's involved in mopping up excess dopamine. In a normal individual, there's a lot of that in that area of the brain, and far less in another area of the brain. Now, a meth user, even one month after abstinence, and this is a chronic meth user, has a lot less of that protein marker, that dopaminergic marker in the brain. And it isn't until many, many months later that um, the system in the brain of this individual approximates something which is uh, seen in the normal um, controls. So yes, the damage done by methamphetamine can reverse, but it takes a very long time. And of course, abstinence needs, needs to be maintained. Another problem with methamphetamine effects are, uh, is that they're very variable. And why is that? Well, for example, all I've said now is uh, effects of meth on the dopamine system, the noradrenaline system, and the serotonin system. But there are many, many other systems that interact. And this is just a simple diagram of the complexity of dopamine neurons interacting with a number of other neurons 
And what can happen is that anything in those other neurons can affect the, um, the changes elicited by chronic methamphetamine and dopaminergic activation. Very important also are genetics. Uh, it's clear that some individuals are more sensitive to the effects of methamphetamine than others. Individuals with a first degree relative, such as a parent or a sibling who are addictive to a substance such as meth, they themselves are at higher risk for developing addictions later in life. So there's a genetic component as well. Age is important. Individuals who begin to abuse drugs at an earlier age are at a greater risk. We know that the brain isn't fully developed until the early 20s for males a little bit later than females. Uh, and and uh, it, it goes to a different extent. And that means that early on, young people who abuse drugs may have more severe or different effects compared to people who are um, late, um, older. The environment plays a role in that stress, such as housing, family, and life events will contribute to the risk of developing addictions and the damage that drugs can, like methamphetamine can have. So what can we do about it? How can we work out what really is going on? And this is where research, basic research is important. And this is, for example, the sort of work that I do. Um, and this is where the humble mouse comes in. And you think like, how can a mouse inform us about what goes on with methamphetamine? Well, that's because the systems in the brain of a mouse that are um, influenced by methamphetamine and other drugs of abuse are very similar to those in the human brain. So we can use experimental animals to have a look at um, the, all the effects of methamphetamine on the different neurotransmitters, on the different factors, and also the genetics of methamphetamine effects. You get this, these sort of pictures, and we use techniques like proteomics and bioinformatics to tease out the thousands of proteins that are influenced by methamphetamine. And we can um, uh, group them into different groups that are involved in many, many different processes of the brain. And of course, I can't go into that because that'll take me another hour or more. And so what I'm going to do is move on um, because this uh, research, what, what we are doing is really, we're hoping to answer these questions. Um, the biological questions, can treatments that affect other neurotransmitter systems reduce the harm associated with methamphetamine? which could be important for uh, treatment options. Can we predict why some individuals are more sensitive to the harm of, harmful effects of meth than others? Um, this comes down to the genetics. Um, can we understand what it is in the adolescent or young adult brain that increases vulnerability to the harmful effects of meth? And can we um, find out how stress and other environmental factors exacerbate the harmful effects of meth? And all that research, hopefully, will give us a chance to predict the effects of meth in individuals, to prevent the effects of methamphetamine in individuals, and to reverse if there is damage. And hopefully, with all that knowledge, one day we'll be able to avoid cases like this wonderful young woman who I saw um, sitting and, and who was obviously in distress, was obviously in trouble, and um, um, hopefully we'll be able to find treatments or prevention strategies for individuals like that. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'll um, um, hand back to Stephanie. So thank you so much for your time, Professor Van der Buse. That was a really interesting background of how ice affects the brain and the importance of doing more research into that area to better understand how to prevent and reduce the harmful effects. So for anyone who had difficulties hearing the video, um, as Professor Van der Buse said, there will be a link provided in the slides and these will be made available after the session. So I'd like now to introduce you to our second presenter, Professor Francis K. Lampkin. So Professor K. Lampkin is internationally recognized for her innovative technology-based interventions for mental health and substance use disorders. And she is the current president of the Society for Mental Health Research and the former president for International Society for Research on Internet Interventions. So Professor K. Lampkin's research is about developing high quality evidence-based care that is accessible and acceptable to people with mental and physical health comorbidities. She aims to bridge the evidence practice gap in four key ways. 
determining what to disseminate, how to disseminate it, who to disseminate it to, and determining when it is best to disseminate it. Professor Kay Lampkin leads an international team of researchers, clinicians, and industry partners in innovative development and translation of evidence-based treatments for comorbid mental health and physical disorders. And this has been recognized for its impact, research quality, and significant translational and commercial value. Her contribution to new knowledge is evidenced by 90 peer-reviewed journal publications in the last five years, with over 2,000 citations. She has led five large randomized controlled trials of face-to-face, phone-based, and computerized psycho psychological treatments for mental health and substance use problems. And she's also translated these treatments into clinical practice. Professor Kay Lampkin's vision is to bring high quality evidence-based treatment for multiple health problems to the point of care for people experiencing mental health and addictive disorders to ensure that the right person receives the right intervention at the right time. So thank you so much for joining us, Professor Kay Lampkin. I'll now hand over to you to present. Thank you so much for that amazing <laughs> introduction. Um, so I've learned a lot about myself at the same time. Thank you. Um, I guess the sum total of that experience means that we, that I hope you to communicate with you today, is that there really are a, a range of psychosocial and particularly e-health treatment approaches that show a lot of promise in both encouraging and engaging people who are using crystal methamphetamine into treatment and retaining them and, and producing the outcomes um, that they would want for themselves. So improvements, not just in terms of reduction of their crystal methamphetamine use, but also engagement in other life activities that can hopefully, hope, um, hopefully help them to maintain um, a, a more functional and better life for themselves. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about these um, already today. Okay, there we go. It's the irony of working with technology. It always messes up the first time you try to use it. Uh, we're on our way now. Just to uh, recap on a few of the things that Martin has already spoken to us um, about, and that is that um, the talk about the effects of crystal methamphetamine directly on, on the brain and what that might mean for the behavior and the capacity of people who are using that drug regularly. So we know we've learned, thanks to Martin, um, what those effects are and why we are particularly concerned about crystal methamphetamine as a drug um, of choice for many people out there um, in Australia, but also globally. What we also know about the drug, and as Martin has also alluded to um, in his presentation, is that it acts on similar pathways in the brain um, on which um, we know that, that psychiatric disorders also have their impact. And so people who are using crystal methamphetamine can often also experience increased psychiatric symptoms um, as a function of their use. And psychostimulants, as Martin has already indicated, are somewhat unique because they particularly are more likely to induce psychosis than our other types of illicit drugs. Um, and I think Shalini is going to speak a little more about that, particularly um, in, our, in the next part of this presentation. But also conditions like depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, um, more basically dysphoria, if not at the level necessarily of depression, and also cognitive deficits. Defic it's, they're really commonly reported whilst people are still using crystal methamphetamine, but also that can tend to, to hang around um, or, or linger after um, in the early stages of cutting down or ceasing use. And so it's really important that we understand that, it's, that these factors are there and these issues are there in the context of the use of crystal methamphetamine and can often... Um, in, in some cases, lead a person to start using crystal methamphetamine as a way to kind of cope with some of these symptoms of these disorders, but also can in and of themselves be a direct consequence of crystal methamphetamine use. So yes, people with mental health problems may continue to use crystal meth to attenuate the psychiatric symptoms that, that they are experiencing, but also importantly, the active use of this particular substance can substantially interfere uh, with psychiatric pharmacotherapy. So if a person has always oh, taking a, a psychiatric um, or, or pharmacotherapy for a condition like depression or like um, anxiety or, or psychotic um, type disorders, then taking crystal methamphetamine can also interfere with the effectiveness of that particular particular uh, pharmacotherapy and make a person to re uh, relapse. And also importantly, crystal methamphetamine particularly can really negatively affect treatment engagement, not just because these other issues um, are around, but also because, um, as Martin has alluded to, the intoxication effects of the drug are quite strong and in the early stages can be quite, quite addictive. 
Uh, so in terms of what we do, um, once someone is uh, is recognising, I guess, that their crystal methamphetamine use, um, at least in part, is becoming a bit of an issue for them. Um, and certainly if there are questions around how do we engage people in treatment um, when they're using crystal methamphetamine, I'm happy to elaborate that on, on either today or in our um, Ask the Expert session um, on crystal methamphetamine that will happen um, in another session. But typically we do have two options that are largely available to us in managing um, crystal methamphetamine use problems um, and that is pharmacotherapy so other sorts of medications that can be used and often they've been used in combination with psychosocial treatments for methamphetamine use. So the pharmacotherapies that are um, around and tested and in use at the moment really are with the aim of increasing treatment engagement and retention to help a person manage those early withdrawal phases from the drug and to help um, with maintenance or relapse prevention treatment. And certainly Shalini will um, talk about some really innovative um, and, and latest evidence um, uh, developments and pharmacotherapies that are happening at the moment in Australia um, in her part of the presentation next. But at the moment, it's really the psychosocial treatments that show the most promise and have the most evidence associated with them and that we can implement them right now, walk out of this webinar today, virtually walk out of this webinar today and start using them with people who are experiencing crystal methamphetamine use problems. So these tend to cover um, approaches, psychotherapeutic approaches, psychoeducation, information about crystal methamphetamine itself and relapse prevention approaches. They can focus on abstinence from crystal methamphetamine um, or working with a person to, to reduce their use over time with a goal of eventual abstinence but also, um, importantly, reducing those comorbid problems that often go along with either driving or as a consequence of crystal methamphetamine use. So things like depression, um, anxiety, um, suicidality, and those other sorts of comorbid problems. And in fact, it's those comorbid problems that are often the ones that prompt treatment seeking in people who are using crystal methamphetamine use. But just a note as well that treatment retention can be quite difficult under these circumstances, particularly when the person is still using. So hang in there and, and try to provide support through that um, tricky time is, is really a message. To go to those psychological treatments or those psychosocial treatments and, and understand a little bit um, about what's inside those treatments, um, to date the strongest efficacy for people using methamphetamine is indeed psychological treatment is these kinds of components. So firstly, contingency management. Um, so that is reinforcing and um, in some cases reimbursing or rewarding attempts at achieving abstinence in the person who's using crystal methamphetamine and attempts to decrease their crystal methamphetamine related risk behaviours. So particular paradigms in contingency management will provide some kind of incentive for a person to, um, to have a go at abstinence um, or to withdraw from or replace some of the other risk behaviours that can often go along with crystal methamphetamine use. We partner that with cognitive behaviour therapy to reduce crystal methamphetamine use directly and to manage those comorbid mental health symptoms. And cognitive behaviour therapy, um, simplified I guess, um, focuses on a person's cognition, so their thoughts, so the thoughts that are related to the, the need to use crystal methamphetamine and why it's important and what role it plays and to test that out in reality to see if that actually holds up and then to work with the person to develop some alternative ways of thinking thinking about those, those situations where they feel like methamphetamine use um, is the only solution. And the behaviour part is um, really focusing on a person's behaviours, believe it or not. We would work with a person using crystal methamphetamine to build up other behaviours and other relationships and other things um, in their life that can actually take the place of crystal methamphetamine use and serve some of the functions that the drug is actually used, um, serving for them. And of course, motivation enhancement training. I say of course because treatment engagement and motivation for change um, in their crystal methamphetamine use are really key issues for people who are embroiled in, uh, in this drug use pattern. And so uh, motivation enhancement um, is really, really important way of encouraging people into treatment and helping them to stick not only with treatment, but also the goals they set for themselves um, with treatment. So that sounds really great in theory, I'm sure, and it's easy for me to sit here um, and say these are the things that really work, but do they actually work when we put them into practice? And so the short answer is yes, they do, and they can actually be quite effective. And we have been doing this for quite some time. 
and particularly with stimulants um, in the whole across the whole psychostimulant spectrum, not just crystal methamphetamine in particular. And I was fortunate enough um, a little while ago now to be involved with a researcher, Amanda Baker, and clinical psychologist, and uh, Dr. Nicole Lee, um, back in the mid 2000s, um, on the very first study of psychosocial treatment for methamphetamine or stimulant use um, amongst Australians in New South Wales and in Queensland. And we recruited 214 people who were currently using um, methamphetamine at least once a month, but it was uh, once, usually once a week and much more frequently than that um, that we attracted into the study. And uh, people were came into the study, did an assessment with us and received, allocated to either a, a control treatment, which was a self-help health, help booklet, which was around kind of the facts and um, information about um, methamphetamine, or they received two sessions of psychological treatment, which was a combination of cognitive behaviour therapy and motivational interviewing. Um, the cognitive behaviour therapy included behaviour or self-monitoring, a bit of the case formulation and some feedback from the assessment, some strategies to help them cope with cravings and, um, and relapses to use. Um, and then uh, all people were then allocated to a four session intervention, which comprised the two sessions in the two session intervention, but then built on that with some additional cognitive restructuring and behavioral activation strategies, and also relapse prevention in that final session four. That's a very, very brief rundown of the content of what we did, but I'm very pleased to say that the treatment manual, which has a step-by-step -step guide as to how you might implement um, the two session and the four sessions um, of these interventions is available at the website that you can see at the bottom of your screen there. Um, or if you just Google Baker at our psychosocial treatment for methamphetamine use, I'm sure it will come up um, that way as well. So you can actually download the content, read it through and start using that um, where you need to, where you think it's relevant with any clients that happen to be engaged with you um, who are using stimulants, including crystal methamphetamine. So people came into our study, as I mentioned, and received either the control treatment, the two session or the four session intervention. And the important thing I think for us in terms of these, um, uh, our attendance rates, which you can see in the flow chart at the bottom of that screen there, is that we did our first, for people who were allocated to the two session or the four session intervention, we did that first session straight away. So we didn't ask for them to we didn't ask them to go and then come back for that first session. We did the assessment, did the randomization, and did a short half hour um, intervention with them for their first session at that same point in time. So at the point in time where they were, people were getting information about their use and their level of use and the impact that was having on their broader life, uh, we were actually also then starting to help them build the strategies they needed to start changing um, some of those outcomes for them. And I think that was really key to those pretty good abstinence rates and completion sessions that you can see there um, in that that flow chart um, on your screens now. But via the, um, the interventions that we received, we actually were able to encourage people to abstain from their stimulants and do that at a significantly higher rate for those who um, completed either the two session or the four sessions. And we were able to verify that, that those abstinence against self-reports by doing random, um, random um, urine drug screens. And so for people who completed the two or the four session intervention, they were achieving abstinence rates of around um, 34 to 38% um, of the group who engage in those particular um, um, treatment sessions, which is encouraging. But for us, it's not good enough, I guess, to say that only you know, 30 odd percent were achieving abstinence. Um, when we follow people up at six months, we still had um, over half of our sample who were using stimulants at least weekly. Um, we know again from what um, Martin was saying, it's the accumulation of use of stimulants and particularly crystal methamphetamine over time um, that can really start to cause um, problems for people over the longer term and can make abstinence and then the maintenance is even harder for them. And so we think that we thought that we could do um, a bit better. We needed to think of ways that we could do a bit better uh, for people who were using stimulants um, than what we're able to achieve in that particular trial. So that was several years ago, a bit over 10 years ago now. Um, and over that time, the same time, we've also experienced a bit of a revolution in other areas of healthcare, where the integration of technology into healthcare provision, monitoring and ongoing support of people with a range of medical conditions has really come into mainstream health. And it's slowly working its way into mental health and it's slowly working its way into um, alcohol and other drug health um, and related services um, to those kinds of issues. And certainly um, our team that we've been working, at, uh, working with at the Matilda Centre and at the University of Newcastle are really working to understand how and when technology-based interventions might be able to augment or supplement or work alongside um, our usual traditional interventions to help people who might need a bit of extra help um, or a bit of 
bit of extra impetus to think about their use and to make changes, particularly to their crystal methamphetamine use. And so really what we're finding is that technology offers quite unprecedented opportunities to increase the translation of behaviour change interventions like the one I just spoke about um, for stimulant use into real world settings and provide 24 seven access to these interventions. And so we were able to do that um, a few years ago now with funding from the Commonwealth Department of Health and Ageing, adapt that face-to-face -face intervention that I spoke about led by uh, Amanda Baker and, and colleagues into an online treatment program called Breaking the Ice and test whether it actually is effective, as effective as the face-to-face -face intervention I spoke about earlier or even more effective um, in a randomised controlled trial. So I'm happy to say that um, Breaking the Ice is available. I'll talk a little bit, a bit about um, how and where that's available in just a moment. Moment. But let's talk about whether it's effective. Um, and so we were able to conduct a randomised control trial of that web-based intervention for people who were using amphetamine type stimulants, particularly crystal meth methamphetamine. And if you're interested in reading a, a bit more about the results of, of that particular trial, then here it is here um, in the Journal of Medical Internet Research um, published back in 2015. Here's what the intervention looked like at, a t at the time. This is how we did things like encouraging motivation for changing current levels of crystal methamphetamine use. So people coming into the study were current regular users of the drug. We had 160 people come into our trial and got them to weigh up the various aspects of their lives and the way um, I guess those other comorbid mental health factors might be having an impact on not only their use but also their current life situation. So we did that very simply. We built in some case studies to help try um, to encourage people to engage with stories for change um, around crystal methamphetamine use. Um, and over time, what we were able to show is that um, people who were randomised to the breaking the ice, the BTI intervention initially, versus a weight list control, were able to make significant reductions in their uh, use of amphetamine type stimulants, particularly crystal methamphetamine use at three months, and also so at six months. What's really interesting is you'll notice that the graph for the control groups, that's the wait list group who only received the assessment and then follow-ups at three months and six months and then receive the intervention after that, also made significant reductions in their amphetamine use. So again, it speaks to the power of actually asking questions and having a conversation the, um, with someone about what they're currently using in terms of crystal methamphetamine and how and what that means about their other life, um, life factors and the impacts on their other areas of life. So it's quite a powerful intervention um, in and of itself. But what we did find when we had a look at people who actually logged on and completed the breaking the ice intervention was that over and above the power of the assessment that I just mentioned, if you completed more modules of the breaking the ice online program, you actually did make um, significantly greater improvement relative to those who didn't complete any modules or who were in the controller waitlist condition. And of course, that was true for a range of factors, but particularly and importantly, I think, um, the online intervention really encouraged um, people to consider um, seeking help through traditional um, means for and formal help for their crystal methamphetamine use problem. Um, so that was in terms of reporting intentions to seek help, but also then actually seeking help and following up and getting some um, additional help for reducing their amphetamine use um, over time. And for a group who's typically difficult to engage in treatment, I think that's a really significant outcome and speaks to the power of this type of technology um, in this space. We were then um, able to get a bit more funding from the New South Wales government and um, developed a better version, we think, of the Breaking the Ice intervention that tries to, um, I guess, build more in that story, those case studies um, of, uh, of recovery and support into the program. And that program is now currently available on the Cracks in the Ice website under the online and resources and videos tab for health professionals. So I really encourage you to get on and use it to refer it to, to people who you think um, might benefit from it, or if you're one of those people yourself, so please get on and have a look. Just in one minute or so I have left, um, I'd also just like to highlight that the impact of crystal methamphetamine use can be much greater than the significant impact it does have on the person. And to that end, we are working with the government and also the cracksintheice.org.au website to really help um, build up a support package for family and friends who have a loved one who is affected by crystal methamphetamine use. And certainly in the consultations that we've done so far around the need to do this, uh, we've been able to get a, a strong sense of support of the support of the idea that it would be very nice for family members and friends to have someone to talk to about what's going on, someone who can give them strategies to help cope and help the person who's experiencing crystal meth problems, to provide access to support services and particularly to be able 
how to do this online and are not important. So we've responded to the call and now again available either at this website um, here on the screen with the access code or again via the Cracks in the Ice website under the Family and Friends portal, you can actually access the support program directly that we've developed in response to the consultations and literature review um, that we've done in association with this particular project. Um, so that's where you access it on the Cracks in the Ice website and I really encourage you to do that um, and to engage with that support program um, to help people um, who are in need in that area as well. So just very finally, finally to summarise, um, the take home message from my part of the presentation, I hope at least, is that people who are using Christian methamphetamine can and will engage in psychological treatment, that that psychological treatment needs to target the common comorbidities associated with crystal meth use, that brief um, cognitive behaviour therapy, motivational interventions and e-health interventions are effective, and particularly those online interventions can be there when other people cannot. And certainly support and friends are critical. Thank you so much to my collaborators and to the Crax team for having me here today. I'm now going to hand back to Steph to introduce Shalini and uh, the exciting content that she has to talk about. Great, thank you so much, Professor Kay Lampkin. It was really great to hear about the importance and effectiveness of psychosocial treatment. I'd like now to introduce you to our third presenter for the day, Dr. Shalini Araguri. So Dr. Aguri holds a Bachelor of Medicine with Honours, a Certificate of Advanced Training in Addiction Psychiatry, as well as a PhD in Addiction Studies. She is a clinical lead at Turning Point, which is statewide specialist clinical services, a consultant addiction psychiatrist, and a senior lecturer at Monash University. So Dr. Aguri's clinical and research interests include methamphetamine use disorder, and related mental health comorbidity and women's health and addictive disorders. She is the study coordinator and medical advisor to a range of current clinical trials for pharmacotherapies of addictive disorders at Turning Point. And these include the trials for Lima, Liz Dexamphetamine for methamphetamine addiction, and ICE, which is N-acetylcysteine for ICE, and debut clinical trial for long-acting injectable buprenorphine. So Dr. Aguri is a passionate advocate for women's equality in medicine and academia. She is active on social media and a proud mother of a three-year-old boy. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Aguri, and I'll now hand over to you to make your presentation. Thanks for that intro, Steph, and um, thanks for soldiering on with my last name as well. It's not the easiest, <laughs> so Shalini is fine. And um, thanks for having me on today. I'm really excited to be able to share this information with everyone online. Um, so as you know, as we've heard from, from Martin and Francis so far, I think um, everyone on the webinar will really know that you know methamphetamine use has, has taken a real toll on, on a lot of people, not just individuals who use the drug, but also the family and the communities around them. And we've struggled for some time to, I think, to, to look at a range of treatment options for individuals with that problem. Um, I um, have the privilege of being able to work, I suppose, in clinical settings as well as in research settings. And in my clinical work, I see a lot of people who are affected by ICE, um, who've had, you know, a few goes at detoxes, for instance, or rehabs, but really struggle to kind of maintain the long-term um, reduction or abstinence from use. So this is where I think some medications can often um, add another tool to the toolbox. We certainly have medications that can be a useful option in lots of other spaces, such as opiate use disorder, or also to some extent alcohol use disorders. But this hasn't been something that's really been available for ICE until very recently. So I'll take you through a little bit of background around medication treatments for methamphetamine, and then I'd like to spend a bit of time talking to you about two current trials that are happening in Australia, um, which hopefully will really bring some new evidence to this space. So in putting this in context, methamphetamine use is, um, as Francis touched on, a little bit um, unlike some of the other drugs that we usually treat in treatment settings. Um, people who are withdrawing from methamphetamine can have a really tough time, partly because the withdrawal syndrome associated with methamphetamine can be quite protracted. So this screenshot is from our recent uh, methamphetamine guidelines from Turning Point, which is available at our website there. And if you have a look at, at the sort of symptoms that people experience in that withdrawal phase, most detox settings, so most residential withdrawal admissions, last for about seven to 10 days. But we can see from that image really that what we're looking at in terms of someone experiencing cravings and um, additional sort of symptoms beyond that period can go up to two weeks, sometimes up to months um, following that episode. 
So that's the period where people are actually really trying to give it a good go in terms of engaging in counseling treatments or other psychological treatments. And we know that if people actually engage in those psychological treatments and can get retained in that sector, so can see their counselor for a long period of time, that people actually do really well. But I think the difficulty can often be that people often drop out in that early phase because that can be really difficult to kind of maintain that motivation whilst you're experiencing those protected withdrawals. So if we think about what medication options might be available in this space, um, there have been several trials to date, and um, there have been a couple of big reviews of those trials. Um, I've put one, um, one up there for you. And so this is the most recent overview of evidence done by Nicole Lee and colleagues here in Melbourne. And it looked at 49 studies to date that looked at different um, medications in the space. And really, um, you know, it's a sobering kind of conclusion in the sense that, that there were 33 um, uh, level two RCTs, so randomized control trials, which actually compared medication against a placebo, for instance. And out of those 33 studies, nothing has really been shown to be consistently effective in this space. So um, some of those medication trials, as you can read below, um, have involved stimulants. So they include things like methylphenidate or Ritalin, um, and also medications like dexamphetamine. And so methylphenidate and dexamphetamine are frequently prescribed for um, attention deficit disorder in children and in some cases adults. Um, we also have um, studies that include bupropion, which is an um, antidepressant, and naltrexone. So taking you through that in a bit more detail, four medications across these trials have suggested that there be, might be limited evidence of benefit. So that includes some of the stimulants, such as methylphenidate, but um, some of the other medications might be helpful on a case-by-case -case basis. What we're looking at here is very much sort of inconsistent evidence from across those studies, and there are a range of reasons that might be. Um, I guess that today in clinical practice, what we tend to do is in the withdrawal phase, most people would um, usually be prescribed some sort of sedative, usually diazepam or valium, to help them manage um, irritability or sleep difficulties. Um, beyond that, we don't really have any evidence based for any medication to kind of continue in that longer term. Um, in the longer term as well, in the absence of that evidence base, where um, we are aware that lots of these other medications, so stimulants in particular, such as methylphenidate or dexamphetamine, they can be associated with a whole range of other side effects, and they can also be associated with the risk of diversion or misuse um, as stimulants being, um, being stimulants themselves. So, um, you know, if people are actually being prescribed these medications currently before the evidence base is really shown that they're actually useful for methamphetamine use disorder. It's a whole range of risks there that are really not being, um, you know, considered in that space. So that brings us to kind of newer sort of treatment trials. And across all of these trials that have been conducted, the main concerns really have related to these three, um, you know, the three drawbacks that I've um, highlighted there. The questions have been raised around sort of dose, um, and they've been raised around dropout and duration. So if you look at some of these trials, um, many of them have been conducted where we're um, basing this on evidence from other spaces, such as depression, for instance, or withdrawal from other substances. And we're not quite sure whether the dose that are being used in the trials is high enough. So in other stimulant agonist treatments, such as dexamphetamine or methylphenidate, um, the evidence here has been drawn from ADHD and doses in ADHD. But we know that um, people who use methamphetamine every day um, are really um, having a history of a tolerance to stimulants. So for instance, all of those different neurotransmitters that Martin talked about in the first um, presentation, those neurotransmitters have adapted over time, the receptor systems. So over time, people have developed a tolerance for these particular stimulants. And so for instance, if the dose in these trials um, is too low, people might actually not um, experience benefit from that dose and perhaps a high dose might work. The other question has been around dropouts, and um, a lot of these trials have had very poor retention over time. Um, Francis talked about the CBT trial, for instance, that had a, a fairly good retention in comparison to lots of other trials to date with medication treatments where the dropout can be as high as 50 or 60%. Um, when that happens in a trial, we can't really conclusively say whether the placebo medication has worked or whether the um, active medication has worked. So that really um, impacts on that. Duration is also of concern because most of these trials are short-term trials, they're 12 to 14 weeks, and beyond that, we're not really sure whether the medications are actually going to have much of a benefit. So that brings us to a couple of new trials um, being conducted here in Australia. Before I get on, I'm just shout out to our clinical team here at Turning Point and really highlighting this is just one site of six sites on a couple of these trials. And it just goes to show that the amount of people that kind of come together 
to do this work. It's a lot of work that goes into running a clinical trial. And the most important sort of people in the trial are really the participants, who's obviously um, for confidentiality reasons, I haven't put their faces up on here. But really, it takes a team effort to be able to produce this evidence um, to draw on and um, really highlights kind of work that goes on in the space. So it's really exciting to be able to do that here in Australia. In terms of NICE, that's the first trial I'll talk to you about. And NICE is a trial of um, N-acetylcysteine. That's the medication there. And um, the other term for it is NAC. So N-acetylcysteine is a medication that's um, already been used for a range of different things um, in, in medical situations, in emergency departments, for instance, is delivered intravenously for people who have Panadol poisoning. Now here it's been used in a way it's never been used before um, in new doses and in new formulations. And the reason here is whether we're trying to see whether it will actually reduce craving for ice and help people stop using ice. So a couple of publications have been generated out of this so far. Um, including that publication um, over there by Rebecca McKinnon and colleagues. And Rebecca is the lead investigator on this trial based at Curtin University. Um, that tri trial has been, uh, the protocol for that trial has been published and so you can certainly read more about it. Um, this again highlights the, the whole range, the cast of thousands that goes into producing work of this nature. And um, this is trials recruiting across a range of sites. So we're one of the sites here in Melbourne. Um, there's also a site over in Geelong and there's also a site in Wollongong um, and and this is continuing to recruit across these range of areas. So coming back to NAC, so what is NAC? So as I was mentioning before, it's been used in paracetamol poisoning. It's um, uh, essentially a supplement or an essential medicine as well. And it's got a range of other potential uses. For instance, um, it's been trialed as a fertility treatment, it's been trialed in influenza. There's a whole range of trials in the psychiatric disorder space as well. Um, it can be purchased over the counter or over the internet as well. Um, it's not approved in Australia as a medicine in itself, um, but people can purchase it as a supplement. And how it actually works, or is thought to work potentially in this space, is really around two key pathways in the brain, um, potentially through an antioxidant sort of pathway and also through a glutamate um, pathway. You might have recalled from one of the slides that Martin spoke about before that methamphetamine acts in a whole range of different neurotransmitter systems. Um, one of them is including um, the glutamate system, which is implicated in um, most reward pathways. So it's a common pathway that might be, um, um, might be actually implicated in a whole range of addictive disorders. So both of these pathways are really relevant to people who have developed a methamphetamine use disorder. And it's one of the reasons that we think it might be a useful medication in this space. Um, also, the trials to date that have looked at psychiatric disorders have looked at um, a whole range of disorders that include um, symptoms of psychosis, depression and anxiety, all of which we know um, are very common in people who use methamphetamine regularly. So another reason to look at it in this space and also through impulsivity and compulsivity pathways. So in terms of trialing it to date, um, there have been a couple of small trials really um, that have looked at it for craving and also around neurotoxicity and possibly neurotoxicity um, protection effect. Um, that includes a small trial in Iran and a larger trial now. So within our trial, what we're actually looking at is whether a really higher dose of, of um, oral n so 2,400 milligrams, which is higher than what you might be able to purchase, for instance, off the internet, um, whether that dose would actually reduce methamphetamine use relative to a placebo medication, um, whether it looks at dependence and craving as well and withdrawal symptoms, and also looking at psychiatric symptoms, including symptoms of depression, anxiety, and psychosis. So this is a 12-week study, and people will either receive the active drug or the placebo. And it's been conducted, as I mentioned, at three sites, and um, we're about halfway through recruitment at the moment, so we're hoping to get to 180 across all of these three sites. Um, people, um, interestingly, in the study, people can actually participate within the community so they don't actually have to come into treatment or into a treatment setting. And this is a really unique feature of this trial that was um, purposely designed because we know that there's such a big treatment gap for people with methamphetamine use disorders. So we know that the majority of people who have problems with methamphetamine use don't actually um, engage or seek treatment. So this trial is really kind of bring the trial to you, per se. So we've got researchers who will come out and do outreach assessments in the field. And really the trial is trying to be um, as little burden as possible to participants to try and see if in a realistic setting whether this will actually make a difference. Um, people also get, uh, participants also get a copy of the brochure on ICE, um, but that's the only other intervention they get. So they don't actually receive any formal counseling per se. In terms of eligibility criteria, they're really broad in this trial to be able to try and make this as, as realistic as possible. Um, and so the medication itself is quite a benign medication. It's got very few side effects. 
Um, if anything, it's really around sort of gastrointestinal symptoms that we might be expecting, such as nausea or diarrhea. But beyond that, there's little else to worry about. And in terms of the endpoints, as I mentioned, we'd be largely looking at use, measured in a couple of different ways, and also craving, withdrawal, depression, and um, psychotic symptoms as well. Importantly in this trial, because this isn't tested um, ever before, what we'll be looking at as well is tolerability of the medication and safety as well, and whether or not people are actually taking the medication regularly. So that's the end of the, the NICE trial um, itself. And if you're interested in reading more about it, um, there's a couple of websites you can read up more, and there's been a couple of media releases and coverage as well. If you are listening and you're located in Melbourne and interested in either participating or hearing more, I've put on the contact details of our local um, site researcher as well. So moving on to list X amphetamine second trial, Lima. Um, this trial has had a bit of coverage in the media, not always some um, non-stigmatizing coverage. Quite a lot of this is used language we prefer not to have used. But in these um, coverage, I think what's really highlighting is the absence of other medications in this space and how important it is to get the word out there. So this trial um, is called the LIMA study, List Amphetamine for Methamphetamine Addiction. And if you're interested again to read more about it, um, it's in a publication, but also if you look at the ANZ CTR website and search for that study, you'll be able to read more about the study itself and the protocol. This grew from a pilot study that was conducted by Nadine Izzard and colleagues over in Sydney. Um, and they were essentially looking at a medication treatment that would be really helpful for people who use very heavily, so almost daily. Um, the pilot study led to a larger study that's now being conducted across a whole range of sites, including our site here in Melbourne. And the aim of the study is really to check whether um, listex amphetamine might be effective in reducing use and cravings and also in withdrawal symptoms. It's to look at dependence, so we're actually conducting it within an outpatient setting um, over a period of time. And again, it's double-blinded and placebo-controlled. So one group gets listex amphetamine and the other one gets placebo. Both groups actually get um, counselling and they actually access the um, CBT counselling that um, Francis spoke about before. Um, participants, clinicians and researchers in this trial don't know which group that people are, um, are in. And we're actually asking people and we're asking the clinicians during the study what they thought the person was getting. That's really interesting because um, the blind itself, you would have thought that most people who get a placebo versus an active stimulant would be able to tell which group they're in. But really studies to date have suggested that that's not the case, that people don't necessarily um, know if they're actually receiving a stimulant. So that's an important part of the trial for us to actually um, test as well. We're again trying to get to 180 people across those sites. And the reason why we're investigating this is really, as I've mentioned before, stimulant agonists to date, methylphenidate, dexamphetamine, haven't been shown to be as effective, as effective as we'd hoped. A range of features suggest that this might be more effective, and the reason is that really it's got a slower onset of action and a longer duration of action compared to dex. And the um, important thing here in this space is that it can be given to someone once a day rather than having to be taken multiple times a day. That's a really helpful feature for longer term use as well, because then the person doesn't have to remember to take it regularly. And it could also be supervised, for instance, in the same way we supervise suboxone or methadone for opiate dependence. Um, Listex amphetamine compared to other stimulants also has less diversion or abuse liability, and crushing it doesn't actually release the free dex amphetamine. The reason for that is it's converted within the body by the red blood cells to the enzymes in the red blood cells over to dex amphetamine, which is the free drug itself. And so it reaches a peak concentration of about three and a half hours after the dose, and it lasts for up to about 12 hours. And therefore, again, as I mentioned, it can be taken in the morning, for instance, and it should last through the whole day. The potential side effects and adverse effects here are important. They're of any um, side effects of a potent stimulant. And importantly here in this trial, we're using a much higher dose than that's previously been used. So I've screenshotted here, for instance, um, when it's when the medication is being used for other disorders. In Australia, for instance, it could be prescribed for ADHD. In the US, it's also prescribed for eating disorders, binge um, eating disorders specifically. And so here you can see the range of doses that people might be prescribed. In this trial, we're using about um, you know, up to 250 milligram doses, which are much higher than doses seen in previous trials. So that's really important because those sort of doses are where we might see some of these um, side effects, especially sort of heart-related or cardiac side effects. And so we screen really thoroughly for that in the trial. Um, other exclusion criteria and inclusion criteria really kind of depend on mental health stability and people being able to take um, a high dose stimulant regularly without any risk to themselves. 
Um, the other inclusion criteria, importantly, are that we're really trying to target this for people who have really struggled with other treatments, so they've tried to do counselling or detox and that hasn't worked out, and who are really using quite heavily at the moment, so people who are using almost every day. Um, if we're also hoping that if this medication treatment is an option for um, those individuals at the pointy end, per se, then it should also work backwards for people with less severe dependence down the track. So that's um, the two trials in a nutshell. Um, again, here, this is the Lima Studies website, and you can read further about it. But um, in our second question and answer panel in a couple of weeks, we'll be happy to take more questions about these trials. So in conclusion, um, as Francis and, and Martin pointed out, this is really a drug that causes a whole range of, of problems. And we know that psychosocial treatments can be really effective for most people if they get to treatment and if they're retained in treatment. So to date, we don't have any medication options that have been shown to work really well. So this is why we're trialing these um, new options. So watch this space. This is the end of my bit. And take it to Q&A panel. Hi. So thank you for that, Dr. Aguri. Um, it's really interesting to see some of the latest innovative trials that are happening in Australia. So that's all that we have time for today. Uh, so thank you so much, Professor Van der Busen, Professor Kay Lampkin and Dr. Aguri for your time today. Your presentations have been really interesting and I'm sure people have learnt a lot from you guys. So as advertised, um, these three experts will be joining us again on Monday, the 5th of August for an interactive 30 minute panel discussion. And so this is your opportunity as attendees to ask the three experts any questions you have about the treatment options for ice dependence or any of the other information that was covered in today's session. Um, so please make sure that you re register for the session via the Cracks in the Ice website, cracksintheice.org.au. And we also encourage people to submit your questions before the session so we can make sure that um, they are considered. So we will be holding more webinars and putting new resources on the Cracks in the Ice website over the next couple of months. So I'd encourage you all to subscribe to our mailing list uh, to receive the future updates. So thank you everyone for joining us today and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you again. Thanks everyone.